All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will be talking about community built on culture of collaboration with Turing Way as an example. So let's start with work from home. Online behavior over the last month has shifted significantly with echoing words like flatten the curve and stay home, save lives. We have become more inclined to understanding what is actually going on around us. So what could have been our spare time or technical skills that we used on our work is now going into making something that's socially useful for people. For example, where can I find a mask in Taiwan or how many toilet papers do we need? We're also using our online collaboration platform for staying connected with our family and colleagues alike. Um, at the same time, we have multipurposed our home spaces for remote working, and that's me two days ago in my pink pajama. So over the last 30 days alone, we have about hundreds of online hackathons that have appeared online. Some of them are being hosted by organizations like Microsoft and WHO who have actually the skill and resources to offer to people. And then there are also national efforts in order to crowdsource ideas for medical and non-medical devices for global pandemic. But at the same time, unlike traditional hackathon, these kind of hackathons don't need venue. It does not need catering or traveling. And therefore, anybody who has access to internet has an equitable opportunity to organize such an event. So this talk is not about COVID-19 or working from home or hackathon. I want to focus your attention on open research and communities. This is a very empowering time for people who want to lead open research. And it's a really, really great time for open communities itself. But unfortunately, it's also a time where more people will face barriers to open research, if not done right. So before I go in details, uh, let's define open communities. Open community refers to collaborative efforts uh, in open research that anyone can join or contribute to. And the direction and goals are determined collaboratively. And it's assumed that the resulting work will be made available under a free license. So before I talk about barriers to open research community, I want to discuss the barriers to open research that a lot of us have uh, faced in our life and are very well aware of. So there are barriers like reward system. Our reward system benefits those who already have the resources. Uh, we give importance to novel finding over any best practices for reproducibility or sustainability. Publication costs are generally exceptionally high and especially a biggest barrier for developing nations where people can't pay for such costs. Uh, training and skill transfer, for example, are not incentivized, therefore not accessible for everyone. We often face the leadership which lack heterogeneity and diversity and therefore their decision making is often biased. Talking about institution, often they don't adopt open research as their norm. And there's a general lack of trust. If it's open, it must be low quality, or it might take time, or someone might misuse my data. But there is another barrier to open research community, and the barrier exists in the definition itself. This is definitely though accurate. It, it assumes a lot of things. It assumes that anyone can join and contribute to the project, and that goals are determined collaboratively, and the work is actually made available, which would be useful for uh, global society. The biggest barrier is the lack of open and inclusive culture in our community. When you come to a new place, it's awkward and difficult when rules are clear to everyone in the community, but unspoken, unwritten, and hence overwhelming to the new members. Uh, this, this came out of my conversation with Aiden, who's also a community manager and cares about the culture as much as I do. So for anyone, the biggest barrier to entering a new space, including the open research community, is the simple fact that it is new to them. By not clearly defining a culture that is inclusive of everyone and explicitly invites contribution for diverse members, we can make our member feel quite isolated. For example, uh, Dr. Christy Belli, who's a very well-known open scientist, herself found it very hard to break into the open research community. 
And as she rightly says, that just choosing license is not enough or putting a code on GitHub is not enough. It's about actually improving the accessibility of your community and bringing people in. I will particularly ask not to tweet this part, even though it has been taken from open community and you can find it on Google, but I want to protect the person who's posted this. So this post is an email by one of the members of one of the COVID hackathon, which is being organized in our network. Um, in their post, they clearly said that they were extremely excited by this, this uh, project when they discovered this group. But unfortunately, they were disappointed by the mannerism in the community, and therefore they removed themselves with a request to add a code of conduct to the uh, program. Though the organizers have now added a code of conduct, the problem was that like them, a lot of members had left by that point. And it's needless to say, this post came from a person from a minority group. It's quite dangerous, right, if we don't invest in our culture. So why invest in our culture? As a community leader, if we open our project up for people and we invite them to join, we need to be aware of the fact that the members who share a common interest and common project goal, they come from diverse backgrounds and expectations. And therefore, if we want to build a culture, we have to intentionally design it. We have to intentionally design the first set of culture uh, as our guideline. As very profoundly uh, said by Karin Lakison in one of our Open Life Science cohort call, that you as a project leader must take initiative with regards to what culture you want to foster. If not, a culture will develop without you. And often this culture that will develop without you could be toxic to a lot of your members. So we can't assume that everybody knows what's expected of them or they will figure out how to contribute to your project or that they feel comfortable to be part of your community. We have to make sure that our communities are inclusive by design. Openness, openness cannot be an afterthought. It's not enough to say that here is the goal that we all want to achieve. Here are the skills and teams that we need. We have to understand where we actually want to create our culture from. Our culture should be built on the principle of inclusion and participation, which sets tone for people, what is expected of them, how they can behave with each other, how they can value each other's contribution and what they should advocate, and how they can also maintain sustained engagement with your community. To go on further, I'll talk a little bit about the Turing Way as a project and how we devise a community of collaboration. The Turing Way is an open source book project that involves and supports a diverse research community in assuring that reproducible and ethical data science is accessible and comprehensible for everyone. So this project is led by Kirsty Whitaker, who is a Turing Research Fellow. And she started this project as a lightly opinionated guide to reproducible data science. Uh, she wanted to ensure that all the stakeholders, such as PhD students, postdoc, PIs, they all know which part is their responsibility. So it started as a book on reproducibility. Reproducibility can be defined as when same analysis steps are done on same data set produce the same answer. As simple the definition is, it's extremely overwhelming. Uh, it starts from designing an idea, collecting data, processing data, publishing your data, making sure that it is preserved and that it is available for everybody to reuse so, they, so that this cycle can go on. So she reached out to uh, advocates of open and reproducible research, a lot of them who are already in the call, for example, Rachel, uh, Patricia, Sarah, um, and I think Luis is also here. And when they started off, they reached out to much more members. So this was basically done on one-to-one -one welcoming basis where they encouraged everybody to add their skill in the Turing way. So now one years later, we have 18 chapters, 80 contributors, and a successful community culture that is still growing. So now from uh, the Turing Way team, we have expanded to a whole community of um, researchers, and hence we are also expanding our scope. So from reproducibility, we also want to add uh, information on project design, how to design a project from the beginning, 
how to collaborate with each other, how to communicate, and what are the ethical decisions you have to make. It's about the journey. To draw your attention in the definition of the project itself, we want to involve and support a diverse research community. How can we do that? How can we sustain a col collaboration when your community expands from 10 members to 80 members? Can we create the same level of engagement? Our community is built on open leadership principle, which touches upon understanding, sharing, participation, and inclusion. Understanding to make sure that your work is accessible and clear, sharing so anybody can use and reproduce it, and participation and inclusion so that you create an ownership and welcoming space that inspires contribution. We facilitate all our contribution via GitHub. When you arrive at our GitHub, you will see all our communication and community documentation, starting from what this project is about, how you can get involved, uh, what is the code of conduct, what is the contribution guideline and pathways, and who our contributors are. Not just that, we also document all our successes and failure as a community in the project management. And of course, we also have this book where you can go and learn. So there are these few contribution pathways. You can read and share resources, you can fix bugs, typos, error, you can engage with each other informally, you can review pull requests, help translate, or in general, help us improve our culture. A few examples of the events that we use to engage with people. We have in-person book dash events that we organize periodically. People from many different backgrounds and skills join us to contribute into the project to make its resources more meaningful for the wider community. So the first two were organized by Rachel and Patricia. And again, many members are here. Uh, the last one was organized by me in London. Uh, we also have many members from this uh, meeting here. Uh, particularly, I want to give shout out to Matthews uh, and Carlos in one of the screens who are facilitating our uh, collaboration with their team in Amsterdam. We also hold bi-monthly online collaboration cafe, which is a co-working call to engage with learners and contributors. So it's a two hours call, but you can come in for whatever time is convenient for you. You can just come and say hi, or you can just sit down and work with us. So we want to meet you where you are in the community. You can join the community. You can use the resources to learn a skill. You can share your own skill. You, collab you can collaborate with each other. You can mentor others' contribution. And we will be extremely happy to have you represent our community if you find a shared agency and ownership in the work we do. We value your participation in whatever way you can. So to summarize, the Turing Way as a community promotes a culture of collaboration where we believe that every little bit helps. And in order to assure that, we want to create a welcoming and inclusive space where everybody is treating each other with kindness and openness. These are our members. Um, thank you so much for being part of this journey. And before I go, what can you do uh, at the collaboration workshop? So because you're one of the first people who are experiencing online meeting and conference, and one of the things that I am developing is how to maintain online research communities. Uh, how can we foster inclusive culture? How, what the choices of tools and platform we can have? How can we assure us accessibility and security aspect when dealing with such a large amount of data over online? And how can we ensure well-being of our members? So th these are a few topics that I think are relevant, but I'm sure your perspective will add so much more value to it. And also yesterday we were working on our discussion group where we are writing a blog on managing ad hoc online communities during COVID-19 crisis. Uh, again, as the scope is expanding, we want to create a more extended and accessible version for everybody. Uh, the highlighted part is almost empty, and I have also hijacked an Epsilon Hack Idea documents. If you're interested, please reach out to me. And with that, I would like to thank everybody who's uh, part of Turing Way, or who's, uh, who's been a huge inspiration for us. Um, special mentions to these communities. If you find Sarah, Yo, Patricia, um, Rachel and want to learn more about it, uh, please contact them too. Thank you so much. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, Malvika.
Um, it looks like you've got some questions in the Google document. Um, if anybody who has written a question would like to ask their question out loud, feel free to raise your hand. If not, I'll just read them out loud. Uh, Becca. Um, <clears throat> thanks for your call, it's, re it's really interesting. Um, I was wondering, because you talked a lot about inclusion, and I was wondering whether you'd given any consideration for disability inclusion amongst your members and whether there were any, for example, measures that you already take with respect to that, or uh, even if there are perhaps, um, uh, if, if you're looking for people to help you with that, um, because that's an area that <laughs> affects me, so uh, I, I'm happy to discuss it. So, uh I have to say that the project is developed with people who are right now in the community and definitely anybody with different and much, much more wider perspective are welcome. What we have invested on so far is, is uh, our, um, if the book itself is readable in terms of its fonts, colors, background, can everybody who have a visual disability access this? Uh, we ha we also work with the community uh, of uh, people who are interested in helping us develop it more appropriate for autistic community. Um, however, that's all our experiences so far with this. So Becca, I'll be extremely honored if you would help me developing it in a better way. Um, anybody else want to ask their question out loud? Okay, I'll just read it from the notes. Doesn't playing onus of the culture on the leader defeat the whole purpose of a collaboratively determined open community? So this is this is really, um, really good point. And it really aligns with what we were talking about is that if you do not define the first set of rules as in how your culture should look like, your culture can develop in a way that you did not expect it to happen. So I'm not saying that you need to dictate. You need to obviously have a democratic idea on how your culture should be, but you need to tell that your space is welcoming and inclusive and what is not expected or not acceptable. You need to have, and this is where the code of conduct is so important. I'm not asking you to define the whole details in your code of conduct, but the basic, uh, understanding of how you want the code and in your community to be. So uh, I can give an example of how the Carpentries works. I am uh, a vice chair of their code of conduct. Their code of conduct started with a single document that was taken from the Python Foundation. And now they have uh, become this collaborative, huge uh, understanding of code of conduct, which is much better than Python collaboration because a lot of people had the chance to comment on our documents. So every time we write something, it goes for public uh, comment. And that's the model that we also want to adapt for Turing way and in general is something that we think can work for most communities. I hope that makes sense. I'm sure uh, I can talk to you more about it if you uh, contact me. And then the final question is, what is your approach when a community member does not meet the standards set out in the code of conduct? Um, this is where the enforcement comes, right? So it's not enough to say we've got code of conduct and we expect everyone to behave properly. That's sure, we, we believe each other. Uh, we expect that everybody would follow it, but there could be situation where things are not okay. And therefore you need to define what is the process? How can someone report it? What happens after report? How is, going, how is someone going to handle it? In one of the things that uh, Valerie Aurora, who's uh, an author of uh, the best code of conduct book that could exist, is that your role as a community leader is to protect your community. It may mean that you need to lose one member who's making your community toxic. Um, your Best case scenario would be that situation never comes, but you need to make decision who is getting harmed by someone's presence or absence. Any final question for Malvika? If not, let's thank her again. Thank, thank you so much, much Malvika.